Okay, everyone. Hi, and welcome to Existential Delight. My name is Dylan, and I'll be your host for the next however long this episode is going to take. And uh, we continue our Chesterton reading series today, in which we explore what I've called part two of chapter three. And of course, we're reading from Chesterton's Orthodoxy. And it is a reading, but I also have a lot of commentary, which I will uh, pepper throughout the reading. And uh, it is a sort of semi-interactive uh, session. So if you're watching live, you can interact. I do check the chat box sort of frequently or at different intervals. And uh, yeah, so first of all, just welcome for being uh, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you can be here. And I'm actually really excited because I did a lot of prep work for this second half of the chapter. And the more I revised and revised, the more it felt like I didn't know anything, which is usually a good sign. <laughs> so I am going to give you as much info as I can about the chapter, what Chesterton is trying to convey. I'm also going to give a recap of part one, which I'll show you on the screen just now. I'll also give you a little bit of background about the characters, the people Chesterton mentions as he's going through the chapter. So for example, if you mention someone like Hilaire Belloc, I will show you what that person looked like. I'll read you uh, pro probably a poem that they've written or something that some work that they've done. And then I'll also just give you a very brief breakdown of who they were, just so that you can see, um, you can get a little bit more context about wh what he's writing and who he's writing it to. Um, and I've also found that that actually makes the book more alive when you see the connections it makes to the world and what the world was like at that time. Okay, so this is going to be a very relaxed session. I'm really not going to rush through this. Part one, I sort of had a time limit of an hour. This one, I predict will go probably longer than an hour uh, just because I'm not going to rush it. I'm just going to take my time through this. So if you do watch the whole thing live, awesome. Uh, if you're watching this, uh, I guess from my point of view, from my perspective now, if you're watching this in the future, um, you'll probably be able to see how long it is and you can just decide where you want to jump off. Okay, so hope you're all doing well. Let's have a look and let's start off with just something to get our minds in the right mood for Chesterton. And that's by reading Chesterton. But I'm not going to read you something from orthodoxy. I'm just going to read you a very short poem that Chesterton wrote. And it's one of my favorite poems. I think it's really beautiful. And I'll read it to you. It's called The Christ Child. This doesn't really relate to the chapter, but it's such a beautiful poem that I found this morning. And uh, I've been I've reread it a bunch of times today, and I think that you'll enjoy it. So let's just start off with this. And I think if you're new to Chesterton, it, it sort of shows you how how he can create a sense of reverence through his words really easily. Or well, he makes it seem easy. Okay, so the Christ child lay on Mary's lap. His hair was like a light. Oh, weary, weary were the world. But here is all aright. The Christ child lay on Mary's breast. His hair was like a star. Oh, stern and cunning are the kings. But here the true hearts are. The Christ child lay on Mary's heart. His hair was like a fire. Oh, weary, weary is the world, but here the world's desire. The Christ child stood at Mary's knee. His hair was like a crown, and all the flowers looked up at him, and all the stars looked down. Okay, so pretty short poem, but I just love that those last four lines. The Christ child stood at Mary's knee. His hair was like a crown. And all the flowers looked up at him, and all the stars looked down. Beautiful. So that's Chesterton. If you want to go and check out that poem, it's called The Christ Child. And this is going to take us into basically a recap of part one. I'm going to give a very brief recap of what we discussed in part one and um, how that relates to this part, because I don't want to just jump into part two um, without giving you a recap, just so you can at least sort of find your footing of where we are. However, if you haven't seen part one, uh, this recap is not going to be fully substantial for all the ideas in part one. So I would recommend if the recap interests you, that you go back and watch uh, 
part one video. And of course, if you haven't seen chapter one or chapter two, you can also find those on my channel. So I'll link all of those in the description of the stream uh, when I get a chance. Okay, so let's start with a recap. And what I've done for you guys is I've actually created some slides just to make things a little bit simpler. And this will just basically summarize what we covered in the first part of this chapter. So the chapter is called The Suicide of Thought. And in part one, we went through a few ideas. And what I've done is I've just taken each idea, I've sort of given it a point, and then I'll just elaborate on it a little bit. And like I said, this is just a summary. Uh, these go a lot deeper than I'm going to go here. If you want to hear a little bit more depth to these points, I recommend going back to part one. Okay, so number one, the modern world is full of the old Christian virtues gone mad. Why have they gone mad? This is a good question. They've gone mad because they've been isolated and separated from each other. So you find that some scientists care for truth, but their truth is pitiless, while some humanitarians only care for pity, and their pity is often truthful. So the problem is not that we don't have the virtues. We actually have all the virtues. The problem is just that the virtues have been separated from each other. They've been isolated from one another. And when the virtues don't work in a cohesive whole, you end up in situations where, let's say somebody uh, is trying to be loving and they feel that, you know, love is the love is paramount. I must be loving as a virtue. But let's say that they've they've uh, separated it from the virtue of, let's say, honesty. So this person might need to tell somebody the truth because that would actually be the loving thing to do. But if they've separated love from truth, in other words, if they've isolated the virtues from each other, both are going to suffer because when you're truthful, you might lack the necessary love to taper the truth or to, to temper the truth so it doesn't destroy the person. But you also, when you're, when you're being loving, you need to incorporate some truth. You need to incorporate truth because you're not really being loving if you're not being honest with the other person, especially if they're in a really awful situation right so going back to the recap slide so the problem is not that we have a lack of heart we've actually got a lot of heart our heart is just in the right it just isn't in the right place okay that's the first idea chesterton explores he then goes on to talk to continue this idea but he focuses specifically on humility okay so humility or you know humbleness being humble is meant to restrain two things primarily arrogance and humanity's endless appetite uh, we really are insatiable you give us what we think we want and once we get it we're not satisfied we want more right so Chesterton makes a really interesting point which is that you cannot enjoy anything without humility you can't even enjoy pride because to take pride in a skyscraper and you know how beautiful it is and maybe you even designed it but to take pride in a skyscraper, it must be tall and I must look up at it. So I feel pride because of how small it makes me feel. So it's precisely because I'm able to be humble about just how incredible the creation of the skyscraper is that I'm able even to enjoy the pride that I feel, right? So what Chesterton does in the first part of this idea is he just tries to build up humility and show you how absolutely um, <laughs> necessary it is because by making ourselves smaller the world becomes bigger and it's easier for us to enjoy anything including even pride okay so then I'm just going to continue with humility so you'll see point two over there is the dislocation of humility continued and just to remind you guys this is just a recap of what we did in part one that's why I'm just sort of touching on the topics just so that you have a bit of context when we go uh, into part two now. Okay, so the dislocation of humility, what we suffer from today is humility in the wrong place. We are meant to be doubtful of ourselves, but undoubting about the truth. Now we doubt that there even is a truth, and we assert ourselves without doubt. So it's sort of taken a total, a, a total flip, right? Uh, we used to say that I might be wrong, uh, but I know that there is some sort of a truth which is correct, regardless of my opinion. But now what's weird is our humility is sort of, we, we're so humble that we actually say things like, um, I can't possibly even know the truth because I'm just, you know, 
however you want to describe it. I'm just a human being. I'm just a person. So we're so humble that we, we doubt ourselves even, even tr- attempting to search for truth. So humility in the right place is doubting of oneself and then searching for truth. So saying, okay, I'm going to be humble about myself. I don't know what the truth is. Let me try and pursue something that I think is true and see where that leads me. But having humility in the wrong place would be doubtful that there is even a truth. And so we disrupt our aim. And because we don't have something to aim at, we're essentially aimless. And because we're not aiming at anything, we never go anywhere. And Chesterton sums this up with such a beautiful quote, such a beautiful bit of writing. He says, the meek do inherit the earth. So you could think of it as, you know, the humble do inherit the earth. But the modern skeptics are too meek even to claim their inheritance right was we're, we're so humble again it's we don't it's not that we lack humility it's just in the wrong place we're so humble we we won't even try to pursue truth instead we just dismiss the whole notion that there is even such a thing as truth to pursue okay now the next point that Chesterton moves on to is religious authority and reason and this is so interesting, but it's also really deep. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to adequately sum it up in just this recap. If you'd like to hear more about it, again, just check uh, part one, the previous video before this one. Okay, so if thoughts and ideas are not correctly managed, they could think themselves into points which invalidate thought itself. Now, what are those points? It's a good question. That's what we're going to cover today in part two. That's actually where we stopped last time. We got just to the point where Chester mentions, I'm going to list all of the thoughts which actually lead to us invalidating thought itself. Okay, so if that sounds a bit paradoxical, that's because it is. And if it sounds a bit strange, that's because it is. And we're going to, we're going to really, we're really going to wrestle with that in just a moment. Okay, then quite a scary thing to realize is that the human intellect is free to destroy itself. One generation could literally prevent the existence of the next generation. Uh, In orthodoxy, Chesterton says something like, um, either by all joining a monastery and not having children, or if we all just jump into the ocean, basically, if we all just commit suicide. One generation, the intellect, is free to destroy itself. We could literally end uh, this great journey humanity's been on. Now, religious authority was reared as a barrier to prevent this. Okay, so this is one of the big arguments Chesterton makes is that religious authority is actually one of the ways we try to we try to cover, we try to protect an even deeper authority, a more supernatural authority, an even stranger authority. Religious authority is trying to protect the most supernatural authority of all. What is that? Well, it's the authority of a person to think. Okay, now if this sounds strange, that's because it is. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna dig into it in a moment. Okay, so religious authority was reared as a barrier to prevent this from getting to the point where we have thoughts which invalidate thought itself. And appealing to the authority of reason instead of religious authority doesn't really help because as Chesterton says, quote, once things were wildly questioned, reason could be questioned first. In other words, the authority of reason is not exempt from the the modern fashions of thought, which end thought itself. Um, The authority of reason, you know, if somebody says, come on, have reason, the authority of reason itself can be and has been questioned, brought into question in the same way religious authority has. Okay, let's jump on to recap part three and I am going to switch off these recaps in a moment and then you'll be able to see me and we'll just talk. But so far, I hope you're all with me. Um, If for some reason the audio cuts out or something like that, just let me know in the chat. Okay, so, so far, we've looked at the fact that, and I'll just jump back for a moment, the modern world is full of the old Christian virtues gone mad. They're mad because we've separated them and isolated them from one another. One of the chief virtues we've separated is humility. And it's led to the point where we're so humble, we don't want to even admit that there might be a truth to pursue because we say, well, I'm just a person. How could I possibly know? So we've got a lot of humility, 
The problem is not a lack of humility, it's just in the wrong place. And then religious authority and reason. Religious authority is really trying to protect a much more deep and much more supernatural authority, which is the authority of a person to think. And appealing to the authority of reason doesn't really help because once you question religious authority, the authority of reason will eventually also be questioned. And it has been, as we will soon see. Okay, then let's continue that topic, religious authority and reason. To the modern person who questions authority, the authority of reason must itself be doubted. Since, and this is, my goodness, this is, get ready for a truth bomb. Chesterton says, reason itself is a matter of faith. It is an act of faith to assert that our thoughts have any relation to reality at all. So, religious authority and the authority of reason, you can sort of think of them as both being built on the same ground, right? They're both built on some form of faith. And like Chesterton says, once you start questioning religious authority, it's not long until we start questioning the authority of reason. As a matter of fact, it's not long until we start questioning all authority. Okay, then the young skeptic says, I have a right to, to think for myself. But the old and complete skeptic says, I have no right to think at all. And then Chesterton ties this into, there is a thought, quote, there is a thought that stops thought. That is the only thought that ought to be stopped. And this leads us to the point I mentioned earlier. Religious authority seeks to protect the most undemonstrable. You can't demonstrate this, right? And it's the most undemonstrable and supernatural authority of all, which is the authority of a man to think. Right? You can't demonstrate that authority. Um, it's just something that we take as an obvious truth. Now, I quote Chesterton again. In so far as religion is gone, reason is going, for they are both of the same primary and authoritative kind. They are both methods of proof which cannot themselves be proved. And this is where we stopped last time, because Chesterton then runs through some strains of thought in the modern world. And these thoughts he's gonna, we're going to go through now have this weird quality of stopping thought itself. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to read the chapter now. And we're going to go through them uh, one by one. And this actually takes us to part two. And I think you can already kind of get an idea of why Chesterton has titled this chapter The Suicide of Thought. Because the big, big point he's making here is that thought and certain ideas can actually lead us to a point where our own thoughts end up ending thought. Um, which is so paradoxical and so beautiful, but we're going to dig into it now. And at this point, we're going to turn to the book. I'm just going to read a little bit, and then we'll reflect as we go. Okay, so we're about halfway through chapter three. and This is where we begin with part two. So Chesterton um, basically mentions that religious authority and the authority of reason are of the same kind. They're essentially based on faith. And so then he says, lest this should be called a loose assertion, just in case you think I'm just saying something, you know, I'm not backing this up. Chesterton then says, it is perhaps desirable, though dull, to run rapidly through the chief modern fashions of thought, which have this effect of stopping thought itself. Now, it's very key here that he mentions run rapidly because Chesson is not going to go into great detail. He's not going to give you a full apologetical argument for each of these, um, uh, what's the word? Each of these modes of thought. He's not, he's not here interested in, you know, in nailing the hammer in the coffin of all of these different arguments. He's just going to give you an overview so don't expect him to go completely deep into any one of these. He just wants to lay them out for you. Okay, so the first one is materialism and the view of everything as a personal illusion. So already there, he's already listed two, right? So materialism and the view that of everything as a personal illusion, which you could think of as a type of solipsism. I'm going to put a slide up in a moment so you can see all of these, um, all of these different ideas uh, listed out. So materialism and the view of everything as a personal illusion have some such effect. 
For if the mind is mechanical, so now he's addressing materialism, if the mind is just mechanical, if, every, if everything is reducible down to just matter, right? Uh, all interactions, all experiences, consciousness itself, all of these things are reducible to material interactions. Chesterton says, thought cannot be very exciting. For if the mind is mechanical, thought cannot be very exciting. And if the cosmos is unreal, as if, if, if everything was just a personal illusion, if the cosmos is unreal, there is nothing to think about. But in these cases, the effect is indirect and doubtful. So he's actually admitting here that in these two types of thought, the, the, the point he's trying to make, which is that some modes of thought will actually end thought itself. He's saying in the case of materialism and solipsism, the sort of the, the view that everything is reducible to material, the view that the, the universe, that everything you see is just a personal illusion. It's difficult. It's doubtful. It's indirect to see how these modes of thought could actually lead to the end of thought, right? The suicide of thought, as the chapter is titled. But then he says, in some cases, however, it is direct and clear, notably in the case of what is generally called evolution. Okay, so here, very interestingly, and you've got to follow me carefully on this. Chesterton is going to address the, the third idea here, the third thing that has the quality of stopping thought, but he's not speaking specifically about evolution itself. He's talking about the way we interpret what evolution means. Okay, so the real idea he's criticizing here is actually the idea that there are no distinct, and this is the word he uses, there are no distinct things. That in fact, everything you see, all the different creatures you see, the different trees, the different species. He's saying the idea that all of these things are actually fundamentally just one thing, one entity that's just morphing and changing. And, you know, every animal you've ever seen is just is actually just one thing. Uh, they, they just appear different. But if you go back, eventually you'll, you'll find it's just one thing. And that one thing from which all the animals arise is also actually just one thing. It's part of the larger universe, which is itself just that same one thing. I know this sounds a bit, I'm not, I might not be doing the best job of expressing it. What I'll do here is I'll read you what Chesterton says. But notice he's going to give two sort of views of evolution. He's going to give one which he says that any any orthodox person, any religious person can get behind one view and then he'll describe one which actually has this quality of killing thought itself okay let's read evolution is a good example of that modern intelligence which if it destroys anything destroys itself now here's the two points evolution is either an innocent scientific description of how certain earthly things came about or if it is anything more than this, it is an attack upon thought itself. Now, that's a that's a big thing to say, right? That's a big claim to make. I'll read it again, and then we'll explore these two views. So evolution is either an innocent scientific description of how certain earthly things came about, or if it is anything more than this, it is atta an attack upon thought itself. Okay, so what does he mean, anything more than this? How is that an attack on thought? a good question. If evolution destroys anything, it does not destroy religion, but rationalism. Okay. If evolution simply means, now this is sort of the first point, the point that any orthodox person can get behind. And some of you might disagree, but I'll just read it and then we'll, we'll go through it. If evolution simply means that a positive thing called an ape turned very slowly into a positive thing called a man, then it is stingless for the most orthodox. For a personal God might just as well do things slowly as quickly, uh, especially if, like the Christian God, he were outside of time. Because Jesse been saying, yeah, if, if by evolution you mean that there was such a thing called an ape, and that through a very long and a very slow process turned into such a thing we call a man. Jesse been saying, well, if we can prove that, that's not really the biggest issue, because since God is outside of time, beginning and end, right, beyond time, a priority time, before time even enters the picture, then a God like that doing things slowly or quickly is sort of, 
it's sort of irrelevant to the orthodox, right? Uh, God might as well have used evolution as a means to produce what we think of today as humans. But humans still have these strange peculiarities, uh, which is a whole other topic, right? Like reason and intellect, but we'll talk about that some other time. Okay, so I'm going to go back to this, and I'll just read it a bit back so you get some more context. If evolution simply means that a positive thing called an ape turned very slowly into a positive thing called a man, then it is stingless for the most orthodox, for a personal God might just as well do things slowly as quickly, especially if, like the Christian God, he were outside of time. Now here Chesterton gets very detailed. He says, but if it means anything more, anything more than that, it means that there is no such thing as an ape to change and no such thing as a man for him to change into. It means that there is no such thing as a thing. At best, there is only one thing. And that is a flux of everything and anything. So we've completely abandoned the idea that there even is an ape which can evolve into a human. We're saying that actually all of these categories and distinctions and natures, uh, actually it's all just one entity, one thing. These aren't really words to to grasp it, right? Uh, If you're speaking from a Hindu tradition, you might say Brahman. Right, so br the, that br sound means to breathe or to expand. So the God, which is the source of everything, right, uh, but is itself everything, which is slightly different to the Christian conception of God, which creates everything, uh, isn't necessarily the thing itself and enclosed within the thing itself. Okay, so <laughs> some more context. At best, there is only one thing, and that is a flux of everything and anything. This is an attack not upon the faith. This isn't even an attack on Christianity, but it's an attack upon the mind because you cannot think if there are no things to think about. You cannot think if you are not separate from the subject of thought. Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. The philosophic evolutionist reverses and negatives the epigram. He says, I am not. Therefore, I cannot think. Okay, so, so far we've looked at materialism, the view that everything is a personal illusion, a sort of solipsism. We've now looked at this idea that there are actually no things, that everything you experience is just the flux of one thing that's playing a game on itself, if you want to take that approach. It's delighting itself with its own creations. I don't think that really adequately answers the problem of suffering, but that's that's another topic. Okay, then he says, then there's the opposite attack on thought. So the opposite of everything being one thing that that urged by Mr. H.G. Wells when he insists that every separate thing is unique and there are no categories at all. This also is merely destructive. Thinking means connecting things and stops if they cannot be connected. Um, so the idea that everything is completely unique, that every cat is unique, there, there is no such thing as cats. There is no, I guess you could say, no archetypal reality of cats, no category. <laughs> That's a, a funny pun. Uh, no category for all the different types of cats, right? Okay, so it need hardly be said that this skepticism forbidding thought necessarily forbids speech. A man cannot open his mouth without contradicting it. Thus, when Mr. Wells says, as he did somewhere, quote, all chairs are quite different, end quote, he utters not merely a misstatement, but a contradiction in terms. If all chairs were quite different, you could not call them all chairs. So Chesterton is saying there are categories of things, first of all, and also that the different things we see are not they, they have a distinct identity. They're not just one meshed uh, flux of, of, of unity. There's actually some, I mean, why are there boundaries between objects? Why do I feel the sense of self and, you feel, and, and I experience you as other? Some people say that that's just an illusion, right? I used to think that. It's just an illusion. This, the boundary between myself and yourself actually were just one. This is just an, an, 
this is Maya. This is just an illusion. Actually, we're the same one. But Chesterton goes further and he says, why are, this is, I mean, when you, when you hear it, you kind of go, why didn't, why didn't I think about this? But why are the boundaries there in the first place? Why is there the sense that I am different to you? Why is there the sense that I am separate from you? Now you might say it's a requirement to play the game, that limitation is a requirement. Uh, because if there's no limitation, well, what are you other than limitation, right? You're limited in various ways. Okay, so you might be wondering who Mr. H.G. Wells is. Here's a picture of the gentleman. Uh, he's actually quite a famous author. I'm sure you've heard of him. Um, he wrote, I've got two of his books right here, The Time Machine and The Invisible Man. I confess to all of you that I have not read either of them. I've had this book for maybe two or three years and I've never read it. Shameful, I know. Okay, but that's Mr. H.G. Wells. And just in case you want a little bit of a background, I'm not going to go into too much depth, but I'll just read you a very brief biography. Herbert George Wells was an English writer, prolific in many genres. He wrote dozens of novels, short stories, and works of social commentary, history, satire, biography, and autobiography. His work also included two books on recreational war games. Okay, so Chesterton is addressing Mr. H.G. Wells here in this chapter, right? And he says, Then there's the op opposite attack on thought, that urged by Mr. H.G. Wells when he insists that every separate thing is unique and there are no categories at all. This also is merely destructive. Thinking means connecting things and stops if they cannot be connected. It need hardly be said that the skepticism forbidding thought necessarily forbids speech. A man cannot open his mouth without contradicting it. Thus, when Mr. Wells says, as he did somewhere, all chairs are quite different, he utters not merely a misstatement, but a contradiction in terms. If all chairs were quite different, you could not call them all chairs. Okay, then Chesterton moves on to the next uh, mode of thinking that has the, the, the propensity, the possibility of ending thought itself. And he says, akin to these is the false theory of progress, which maintains that we alter the test instead of trying to pass the test. Okay, that's really powerful. I'll read that again. Akin to these is the false theory of progress, which, maintain, which maintains that we alter the test. We change the test instead of trying to pass the test. We often hear it said, for instance, what is right in one age is wrong in another. This is quite reasonable if it means that there is a fixed aim and that certain methods attain at certain times and not at other times. Okay, so here Chesterton's going to be, I think, a little bit less PC. He says, if women say desire to be elegant, it may be that they are improved at one time by growing fatter and another time by growing thinner. But you cannot say that they are improved by ceasing to wish to be elegant and beginning to wish to be oblong or, you know, like round. If the standard changes, how can there be improvement, which implies a standard? Okay, so let me break that down a little bit. So we try and alter the test instead of trying to change the test. So real progress, right? Good progress is we have an ideal. We have something that we are pursuing. There's something that we're aiming at. We're trying to get there. And that ideal needs to stay consistent. What, what changes is our pursuit of the ideal. We, we look at where we're not matching the ideal and we try to reach it. So Chesterton is saying here, suppose that the ideal for one time for woman was to be elegant. In some cultures, it might be seen as elegant to be larger, fatter. In some cultures, it might be seen as elegant to be skinnier, to be thinner, right? But we haven't changed the goal. We haven't changed the ideal. We have different ideas of what, what the ideal is, but we still know we want to be elegant, right? Then Chesterton says, but you cannot say that they are improved by ceasing to wish to be elegant. You can't say that we've gotten closer to being elegant. We've gotten closer to the ideal. We've gotten closer to the goal by removing the goal, right? By changing the ideal. And this is what Chesterton means when he says the false theory of progress. Uh, the idea that we're making progress by removing the ideal, 
Okay, so uh, you don't have to get your sins forgiven if there aren't any sins, right? Uh, if you're pursuing something and you're not reaching it, the false theory of progress is, well, if we remove the ideal, we'll get closer to where we want to be. And Chesterton is saying this is a problem because we need the ideal and the ideal needs to be consistent. Um, because if you don't have an ideal, you will progress towards something that you're trying to reach, which you'll, in some way you'll form some kind of an ideal because we have to have something to direct our, ourselves towards, right? Chesterton's actually going to go through this idea for the rest of the chapter. But if you have an ideal and you start pursuing it, the moment the ideal disappears, you can't really say you've, you've progressed towards anything because you're going to get where you thought you wanted to be. But because you don't have a concrete ideal, you didn't really progress towards anything. You're kind of in the same place. And now you've got to set another ideal, right? So the ideal is always changing. And so we're never really progressing. Okay, so I hope I made that idea clear. I think I might have gone on, it, on about it a bit too much, but I think you get the idea. If the standard changes, the standard, how can there be improvement since improvement implies a standard? right? Okay, so Nietzsche started a nonsensical idea that men had once sought as good what we now call evil. So what we today call evil, let's say being selfish, uh, being a coward, maybe. Nietzsche said, and this is just just a summary of it, that at one time, what we today consider evil, the selfishness, uh, perhaps, you know, abandoning someone, backstabbing someone, People used to pursue these things as good, and now we say they're evil. So, so Nietzsche is basically saying that the standard has changed, right? We now have a different standard from them. Okay, now watch what Chesterton says. If it were so that, you know, um, men had once sought as good what we now call evil, if it were so, we, we could not talk of surpassing or even falling short of them because we're using different standards. I can't say that um, <laughs> I'm in a, a better position because when I say better, I'm, I'm assuming that there's a standard, right? But we're using, according to Nietzsche, we're using completely different standards. So maybe those guys um, did something barbaric. But if, I'm, if I believe that that was just their standard, then, well, I can't really say anything. I can't say it was wrong to, to commit that evil. I can't say it was because that's just my standard of good and evil, right? So listen to what Chesterton says. He says, If it were so, we could not talk of surpassing or even falling short of them. How can you overtake Jones if you walk in the other direction? Right? We're not even walking in the same direction. We're not even walking towards the same aim, right? We're in completely different directions. So I can't even, you can't even make a comparison. Nietzsche can't even say that things are better now than they were then because he's using his standard. And by his own logic, they were using a completely different standard to even make, um, make their decisions. You cannot discuss whether one people has succeeded more in being miserable than another succeeded in being happy. It would be like discussing whether Milton was more puritanical than a pig is fat. The, the categories just don't match because there's no unifying standard right? If somebody says that there's a standard of right and wrong, then they can look at their standard of right and wrong and they can reflect on history and they can say, well, by my standard, that was an evil thing to do or that was a very good thing to do. The question then becomes, well, where do you get your standard? How do you, how do you ground your standard? And this, this becomes a really interesting question of morality. Just for the interest of time, uh, we'll probably come back to it. But I'm going to move on to the next point. And Chesterton now explores a, a pretty interesting idea. Let's say, that you, let's say that you may change itself the ideal. So you know this thing that we're pursuing, that we're trying to reach. Um, and by the way, when you, whenever you create a goal or an ideal, you're actually creating a judge at the same time. Because your own goal, the thing that you're trying to reach, because you're not there yet, it actually judges you. Let me give you a, an example. So imagine that you tell yourself tomorrow morning, you're going to wake up 
at five o'clock and you're going to wake up earlier, you're going to exercise, uh, you're going to eat healthier and you set up all of these goals for yourself and then you go to bed and uh, let's say you, you sleep really well, the alarm is set and you wake up, you hear the alarm and instead of getting up and doing all the things you said you were going to do, which is your goal, right? It's up here, it's judging you. Instead of doing that, you kill the alarm and you keep sleeping and you oversleep and you sleep until nine o'clock. You then wake up and realize that you've overslept and you're late, right? The question to consider is how do you, how do you feel now? What kind of emotional state are you in? And you quickly realize that you feel kind of terrible because you've, you've set a goal, you've set something that you wanted to accomplish and now because you didn't reach it, the fact that you set that goal is itself causing you to feel judgment. And the higher you elevate your goal, the more judgment you're going to feel. Because, and, and sometimes you can set a goal so high that before you even start, you feel inadequate. You feel that you can't do it because the goal just seems so, so high. So this is interesting because the highest possible goal is also going to be the, the highest possible judge because you can't separate those two things because your goal judges you because you don't, you're not currently reaching it, right? So if you're a Christian and Christ to you is the ultimate goal, then Christ is also the ultimate judge, right? Which fits, oh, it fits so perfectly with the theology. So we can't pursue anything without ascribing value to it and being willing to feel judged by the fact that we're not currently reaching the goal. And so the thing to realize is that it's better to have a goal and not to reach it than to have no goal, right? It's better to have a goal and feel judgment than to have no goal at all. Because a lot of people, they feel the judgment that they're getting because they're not reaching their goals. And so what do they do? They have no goals at all, right? Which is not, not, the, not the right approach. You, even if you're falling short of your goal, it's better to have something and to stumble forward at least. Okay, so that was a huge tangent. Let's now go back to the point I was making, which is that Chesterton is now going to explore an interesting idea, which is we could make change itself the ideal, right? Let's say that a person did that. I'll read you what Chesterton says. He says, it is true that a man, a silly man, might make change itself his object or ideal. But as an ideal, change itself becomes unchangeable. If the change worshiper wishes to estimate his own progress, he must be sternly loyal to the ideal of change. He must not begin to flirt gaily with the ideal of monotony. Right? So an ideal by definition is something consistent that you're working your way towards, but change by definition is something not consistent, right? It's always changing. So Chesterton's just pointing out that progress itself cannot progress. You, you can't set, you can't set change as an ideal because it itself defies the very meaning of the word ideal. I hope that makes sense. So the same is true with progress. You can't set progress as an ideal because pro ideal is something that is steady and consistent and progress by definition means something that is changing. So we can, we can progress towards an ideal, but if progress is our ideal, when we reach our ideal, we haven't really reached it because we just need to keep progressing. It is worth remark in passing that when Tennyson, in a wild and rather weak manner, welcomed the idea of infinite alteration in society, infinite change, he instinctively took a metaphor which suggests an imprisoned tedium. He wrote, let the great world spin forever down the ringing grooves of change. He thought of change itself as an unchangeable groove. And so it is. Change is about the narrowest and hardest groove that a man can get into. The main point here, however, is that this idea of a fundamental change in the standard, a fundamental alteration in the standard, is one of the things that makes thought about the past or future simply impossible. The theory of a complete change of standards in human history 
does not merely deprive us of the pleasure of honoring our fathers. It deprives us even of the more modern and aristocratic pleasure of despising them. Okay, let's break that down. The main point here, however, and now he's summarizing what he said way back when he talked about Nietzsche. And he said that Nietzsche said that in one age, men pursued uh, what we today call evil. Men back then pursued and they called it good. Chesterton is saying here directly that this theory of a complete change of standards, which is what, what that idea suggests, right? A complete change of standards, this theory in human history does not merely deprive us of the pleasure of honoring our fathers. We can't honor our fathers because they're using a different standard and we're judging them according to our standard. That's, that's where this idea leads us to. We can't even take pride because we can't say, well, given you know their standard uh, and I'm in a different standard, I don't have a, a basis, I don't have a framework to make to make statements about their decisions, since our framework is completely different. So along with not being able to take pleasure in the things that they did, because by this definition they have a different standard, it deprives us even of the more modern and aristocratic pleasure of despising them. We can't even dislike them, <laughs> because disliking them again applies a standard. And Nietzsche's idea is saying that no, there's different standards according to different people different ages okay so again uh, and Chesterton is going to emphasize this this is a, a summary right he's not delving deep into each of these different topics he's just giving a sort of surface level answer even though I think his surface level answers are still pretty deep then he says this bold summary of the thought destroying forces of our time would not be complete without some reference to pragmatism now pragmatism um, I've seen it defined a few different ways, but it's generally just a branch of philosophy um, that looks at the practicality, the outcome, the effects of actions. So if you partake in an action that leads to a good outcome, pra there's pragmatic truth to that. There's pragmatic truth in if I follow these instructions, things will work out well for me. Right, so let's hear what Chesterton has to say. For though I have here used and should everywhere defend the pragmatist method as a preliminary guide to truth, and that's important, right? Because he's saying he's not, a, he's not necessarily against pragmatism. He'll even defend it as a preliminary guide to truth, right? Look at, what, look at what pragmatically works for you. I think Jordan Peterson does this a lot with the Bible, right? Where he'll say, well, look, this just works if you orient yourself in life in such a way and you aim at the highest possible good you can, your life will work out better for you than if you did it in any other way. That's, 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 it's, it's very pragmatic. It's very practical. It's very, just do this, you, even if you don't necessarily believe. Just, just try this, and you'll see that there's going to be some value. Okay? So Chesterton says, even though I've, I've defended this as a preliminary guide to truth, there is an extreme application of pragmatism which involves the absence of all truth, whatever. My meaning can be put shortly thus. I agree with the pragmatists that apparent objective truth is not the whole matter, that there is an authoritative need to believe the things that are necessary to the human mind. Okay, so we should have pragmatic truth. But Chesterton then adds and he says, but I say that one of those necessities precisely is a belief in objective truth. The pragmatist tells a man to think what he must think and never mind the absolute. Just do what you need to do. Do what seems practical to you, which is going to give you success. And don't worry about the absolute, etc. Chesterton says, but precisely one of the things that he must think that a person has to have is the absolute. This philosophy indeed is a kind of verbal paradox. Pragmatism is a matter of human needs. And one of the first of human needs is to be something more than a pragmatist. Extreme pragmatism is just as inhuman as the determinism it so powerfully attacks. The determinist, who, to do him justice, does not pretend to be a human being, makes nonsense of the, of the human sense of actual choice. Right, because the determinist believes everything is determined, right? You don't actually have any free will. The determinist makes nonsense of the human sense of actual choice. The pragmatist, who professes to be specially human, 
makes nonsense of the human sense of actual fact. So Chesterton's saying that, yes, we should be practical, we should be direct, but also realize, and this is Chesterton's contention, that one of the requirements in order to, to be pragmatic is to be something more than a pragmatist, to have something beyond just the, the, the pure practicalities of benefit and uh, positive outcome in our lives. We need something more. We need some sense of the absolute. Okay, so... We have three concurrent viewers. That's awesome. I'm surprised when I get one. So <laughs> most people watch these uh, later on, not live. Most of the views come later on, but it's, it's, it's nice to have people here live. That's why I do these streams instead of just recording it. It's nice to know someone's listening. Okay, so to sum up our contention so far, we may say that the most characteristic current philosophies have not only a touch of mania, but a touch of suicidal mania. The mere questioner has knocked his head against the limits of human thought and cracked it. This is what makes so futile the warnings of the orthodox and the boasts of the advanced about the dangerous boyhood of free thought. Okay, so here what I want to do is I now want to just bring up the first slide I'm, I put together. So just to summarize where we are, Number one, modern fashions which have the effect of stopping thought itself. We looked at materialism, the idea that matter is a fundamental substance of everything. Solipsism, everything is a personal illusion. And there's a typo over there, but what are you going to do? There are no individual things, just the flux of one big thing. Every separate thing is unique and there are no categories at all. We talked about the false theory of progress. And we mentioned pragmatism devoid of the absolute. Now, of course, Chesterton does go into great detail on all these topics in other areas. Here he's just giving an overview. Now we come to the next idea in the, in the writing, which is free thought has already come and gone. What seems like free thought in action is actually free thought in disillusion. We have no more questions left to ask. We must begin looking for answers. Okay, so here the idea is that uh, you, you'll sometimes hear people say, if only we had more free thought, then we would solve all of our problems, right? If only we could let go of this archaic, out-of-date, out-of-touch religious thinking, this mythological thinking, if we could just get rid of this, things would be perfect. Now watch what Chesterton addresses here. Very, very interesting. He says, what we are looking at and now he's referencing all of these ideas we've, we've gone through now, right? These ideas which stop thought, which have a suicide built within them. What we are looking at is not the boyhood of free thought. It is the old age, an ultimate disillusion of free thought. It's not free thought, it's the absence of free thought, right? It's, 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 we're losing free thought. It is vain for bishops and pious bigwigs to discuss what dreadful things will happen if wild skepticism runs its course. Runs its course. It has run its course. What's the point of talking about uh, what's going to happen if skepticism gets out of control? Chesterton is saying it's already gone out of control. It's already lost its course. It is vain for eloquent atheists to talk of the great truths that will be revealed if once we set free thought begin. Uh, if once we see free thought begin, we have seen it end. Okay, so it's vain for eloquent atheists to talk of the great truths that will be revealed. Just the great truths we could find if we could just allow free thought to flourish. Chesterton is saying, not only has it, have we seen the beginning, we've seen it end. It's over, right? You cannot pull up any wilder vision than a city in which men ask themselves if they have any selves. Right? This is just an example of this free thought that we've already allowed uh, just to go really anywhere to the point where you have a city of, of men which ask themselves if they even have any selves. That's the pinnacle of free thought, right? It's not necessarily a good thing is Chesterton's point here. You cannot fancy a more skeptical world than that in which men doubt if there is a world. It might certainly have reached its bankruptcy more quickly and cleanly if it had not been feebly hampered by the application of indefensible laws of blasphemy or by the absurd pretense that modern England is Christian. But it would have reached the bankruptcy anyhow. Militant atheists are still unjustly persecuted. 
but rather because they are an old minority than because they are a new one. Free thought has exhausted its own freedom. Man, this is one of those lines, right, that could actually change your whole perspective. We think of atheism as such a new thing. But I'll just read that again, and I'll just let you mull it over. Militant atheists are still unjustly persecuted, but rather because they are an old minority, not because they're a new one. Free thought has exhausted its own freedom. It is weary of its own success. If any free thinker now hails philosophic freedom as the dawn, he is only like a man in, in Mark Twain who came out wrapped in blankets to see the sunrise and was just in time to see it set. If any frightened curate still says that it will be awful if the darkness of free, of free thought should spread, we can only answer him in the high and powerful words of Mr. Belloc, who says, quote, Do not, I beseech you, be troubled about the increase of forces already in disillusion. You have mistaken the hour of the night. It is already morning. We have no more questions, uh, sorry, end quote. We have no more questions left to ask. We have looked for questions in the darkest corners and on the wildest peaks. We found all the questions that can be found. It is time we gave up looking for questions and began looking for answers. So if you're wondering who Chesterton is mentioning here, right, he says, uh, if, if somebody says that it will be awful if free thought should spread, he then quotes Belloc to point out that um, you think it's night? It's actually already morning. Free thought has spread. These ideas have already dissolved. Um, the state of thought has already, in some sense, committed suicide. It's already a past event, is what he's saying here. Now, Mr. Hilaire Belloc, very interesting guy. Let me show you a picture of him. Okay, that's Mr. Belloc. Him and Chesterton were good friends. I've actually got a picture here. I showed it in the last episode where you can see... Let me just remove this. Where well, you can see on the right, Chesterton. On the far left, you can see Mr. Bernard Shaw. And in the middle, you can see the very cheerful Mr. Belloc, Hilaire Belloc. Now, I'll give you a little bit of a uh, just background. And then I'll give you one of his poems. It's literally two lines and it's really nice. I think it's a great poem. Uh, let me just remove this. Okay, so just a quick summary of who he was. Joseph Hilaire Pierre René Belloc was a British French writer and historian and one of the most prolific writers in England during the early 20th century. Belloc was also an orator, poet, sailor, satirist, writer of letters, soldier and political activist. His Catholic faith had a strong impact on his works. Also one of the reasons him and uh, Chesterton got along so well, right? Chesterton is Catholic, um, which we'll explore in some future episode. Okay, and uh, a great book of his, if you're curious, is called The Path to Rome. Very interesting writer. And I'll give you a little poem by him. It's, I think, two lines. It's, it's beautiful. It's one of those poems you can memorize. It says, When I am dead, I hope it may be said, His sins were scarlet, but his books were red. When I am dead, I hope it may be said. His sins were scarlet, but his books were red. Okay, when I am dead, I hope it may be said. His sins were scarlet. So scarlet's like a, a very rich red, right? Or sort of almost got an orangey tone to it. But his books were red. So even though my sins were awful, hopefully my books are being read. But red also works in such a beautiful way because, you know, he's, he's deliberately contrasting or he's de deliberately connecting scarlet with the word red as a color, but also as, as to read something, right? When I'm dead, I hope it may be said, his sins were scarlet, but his books were red. I guess his wish came true, right? People are still reading Belloc. More and more. Okay. Let's take him away for now. Okay, so that was another tangent. Let's move on to the next point, which is now what Chesterton's going to do is he's going to turn his sights to a specific topic, which is the worship of will. So what happens is, like we mentioned earlier, people start questioning religious authority and saying we should listen to the authority of reason, right? But like we said, religious authority and the authority of reason are essentially both based on the same metaphysical substructure, the same foundation. Uh, both are essentially uh, 
putting trust in something that you cannot prove in itself. You cannot prove the authority of reason in itself. Uh, you cannot prove necessarily the authority of religious authority in itself. And so once we start questioning religious authority, it doesn't take long before we start questioning the authority of reason. Now, when that happens, some thinkers then appeal not to the authority of reason or, the, or religious authority. They appeal to the authority of the will. Okay, will, willpower. And this is some differences between, well, as far as I know, there's some differences between will and willpower, and there's some intricacies there, but we don't need to go there right now. Let's explore this next idea that Chesterton's going to take us into, which is the idea of the worship of will. And so our mental ruin has been created by wild reason, not by wild imagination. Seeing that reason destroys, certain thinkers claim that the ultimate authority lies in will, not in reason. Every act of the will is actually an act of limitation. So to choose anything is to reject everything else. You cannot praise an action for showing will, because that is merely to say that it is an action. And so you can't really choose one course as better than another, and yet choosing one course as better than another is the definition of the will we are praising. The worship of will is the negation of will. So those are a few points. Let's actually read through it now and get some more. Um, those are like the bones. Let's read through it and get some flesh on the bones, some meat on the bones. Okay, but one more word must be added. At the beginning of this preliminary negative sketch, I said that our mental ruin has been wrought by wild reason, not by wild imagination. A man does not go mad because he makes a statue a mile high, but he may go mad by thinking it out in square inches. Now, one school of thought thinkers has seen this and jumped, uh, jumped at it as a way of renewing the pagan health of this world. They see that reason destroys, but will, they say, creates. The ultimate authority, authority they say, is in will, not in reason. The supreme point is not why a man demands a thing, but the fact that he does demand it. I have no space to trace or expound this philosophy of will. It came, I suppose, through Nietzsche, who preached something that, can be, that is called egoism. That, indeed, was simple-minded enough, for Nietzsche denied egoism simply by preaching it. To preach anything is to give it away, which is not very egotistical, right? First, the egoist calls life a war without mercy. And then he takes the greatest possible trouble to drill his enemies in war. To preach egoism is to practice altruism. But however it began, the view is common enough in current literature. The main defense of these thinkers is that they are not thinkers. They are makers. They say that choice is itself the divine thing. Thus, Mr. Bernard Shaw has attacked the old idea that men's acts are to be judged by the standard of the desire of happiness. He says that a man does not act for his happiness, but from his will. He does not say, jam will make me happy, but I want jam. And in all this, others follow, and, and in all this, others follow him with yet greater enthusiasm. Mr. John Davidson, a remarkable poet, is so passionately excited about, about it that he is obliged to write po prose. He publishes a short play with several long prefaces. This is natural enough in Mr. Shaw, for all his plays are prefaces. Mr. Shaw is, I suspect, the only man on earth who has never written any poetry. But that Mr. Davidson, who can write excellent poetry, should write instead laborious metaphysics in defense of this doctrine of will, does show that the doctrine of will has taken hold of men. Even Mr. H. G. Wells has spoken in its language, saying that one should test acts not like a thinker, but like an artist, saying, I feel this curve is right, or that line shall go thus. They are all excited, and well they may be. For by this doctrine of the divine authority of will, they think they can break out of the doomed fortress of rationalism. They think they can escape. But they cannot escape. This pure praise of volition ends in the same breakup and blank as the mere pursuit of logic. 
exactly as complete free thought involves the doubting of thought itself, so the, accepta so the acceptation of mere willing actually paralyzes the will. Mr. Bernard Shaw has not perceived the real difference between the old utilitarian test of pleasure, clumsy of course and easily misstated, and that which he propounds. The real difference between the test of happiness and the test of will is simply that the test of happiness is a test and the test of will is not. You can discuss whether a man's act in jumping over a cliff was directed towards happiness. You cannot discuss whether it was derived from will. Of course it was. You can praise an action by saying, excuse me, you can praise an action by saying that it is calculated to bring pleasure or pain, to discover truth or to save the soul. But you cannot praise an action because it shows will. For to say that is merely to say that it is an action. By this praise of will, you cannot really choose one course as better than another. And yet, choosing one course as better than another is the very definition of the will you are praising. The worship of will is the negation of will. To admire mere choice is to refuse to choose. If Mr. Bernard Shaw comes up to me and says, will something, that is tant tantamount to saying, I do not mind what you will. And that is tantamount to saying, I have no will in the matter. You cannot admire will in general because the essence of will is that it is particular. A brilliant anarchist like Mr. John Davidson feels an irritation against ordinary morality and he therefore and therefore he invokes will. Will to anything. He only wants humanity to want something. But humanity does want something. It wants ordinary morality. He rebels against the law and tells us to will something or anything. But we have willed something. We have willed the law against which he rebels. All the will worshippers, worshippers, from Nietzsche to Mr. Davidson, are really quite empty of volition. They cannot will. They can hardly wish. And if anyone wants proof of this, it can be found quite easily. It can be found in this fact that they always talk of will as something that expands and breaks out. But it is quite the opposite. Every act of will is an act of self-limitation. I'm sure that's got to be a, fa a famous quote. Every act of will is an act of self-limitation. So when we will something, in some way we're limiting ourselves. How, in, in what way? Okay, well, let's, let's, let's explore, because Chesterton is going to give us a few great examples here. When you choose anything, you reject everything else. That objection, which men of this school used to make to the act of marriage, is really an objection to every act, because every act is an irrevocable selection and exclusion. Just as when you marry one woman, you give up all the others, so when you take one course of action, you give up all other courses. When you will to do one thing, in that same moment, you're sacrificing something else, right? Okay, so if you become king of England, you give up the post of Beadle in Brompton. If you go to Rome, you sacrifice a rich, suggestive life in Wimbledon. It is, it is the existence of this negative or limiting side of will that makes most of the talk of the anarchic will worshippers little better than nonsense. For instance, Mr. John Davidson tells us to have nothing to do with thou shalt not. But it is surely obvious that thou shalt not is only one of the necessary corollaries of I will. I will go to the Lord Mayor's show and thou shalt not stop me. Anarchism abjures us to be bold, creative artists and care for no laws or limits. But it is impossible to be an artist and not care for laws and limits. Art is limitation. The essence of every picture is the frame. Wow. It is impossible to be an artist and not care for laws and limits. Art is limitation. The essence of every picture is the frame. If you draw a giraffe, you must draw him with a long neck. 
if in your bold creative way you hold yourself free to draw a giraffe with a short neck you will really find that you are not free to draw a giraffe the moment you step into a world of facts you step into a world of limits you can free things from alien or accidental laws but not from the laws of their own nature you may if you like free a tiger from his bars but do not free him of his stripes do not free a camel of the burden of his hump. You may be freeing him from being a camel. Do not go about as a demagogue, encouraging triangles to break out of the prison of their three sides. If a triangle breaks out of its three sides, its life comes to a lamentable end. Somebody wrote a work called The Loves of the Triangles. I never read it, but I am sure that if triangles ever were loved, they were loved for being triangular. This is certainly the case with all artistic creation, which is in some ways the most decisive example of pure will. The artist loves his limitations. They constitute the thing he is doing. The painter is glad that the canvas is flat. The sculptor is glad that the clay is colorless. So limitations are necessary, right? I'm reminded of a game of chess. Um, I quite enjoy playing chess and if you're playing a game you need to have limitations all of the rules are forms of limitations but it's precisely because of those limitations that we're allowed to play the game adequately so when a will worship is telling you that you know actually what's paramount is that we just follow our will will something chess it is saying no we've, we've willed limits we've willed ordinary morality we've already willed something and you're telling us to will ourselves beyond it to will ourselves beyond morality and we're saying that's exactly what we have willed you want us to rebel but we've willed the thing which you're rebelling against right so to will is to imply limitation upon oneself to make any decision to do something is, a, is at the same time a decision not to do something else so when you worship the will uh, you're worshiping the, you're worshiping limitation in a sense Okay, so <laughs> after all of that, after all those, those different examples, Chesterton says, in case the point is not clear, a historic example may illustrate it. The French Revolution was really an heroic and decisive thing because the Jacobins willed something definite and limited. They desired the freedoms of democracy, but also all the vetoes of democracy they wished to have votes and not to have titles. Republicanism had an ascetic side in Franklin and Robespierre, as well as an expansive side in Danton or Wilkes. Therefore, they have created something with a solid substance and shape, the square social equality and peasant wealth of France. But since then, the revolutionary or speculative mind of Europe has been weakened by shrinking from any proposal because of the limits of that proposal. Liberalism has been degraded into liberality. Men have tried to turn revolutionize from a transitive to an intransitive verb. The Jacobin could tell you not only the system he would rebel against, but what was more important, the system he would not rebel against, the system he would trust. But the new rebel, the modern rebel, is a skeptic and will not entirely trust anything. He has no loyalty. Therefore, he can never really be a, re a revolutionist. And the fact that he doubts everything really gets in his way when he wants to denounce anything. For all denunciation implies a moral doctrine of some kind. And the modern revolutionist doubts not only the institution he denounces, but the doctrine by which he denounces it. Thus he writes one book complaining that imperial oppression insults the purity of woman. And then he writes another book about the sex problem in which he insults it himself. He curses the Sultan because Christian girls lose their virginity. He then curses Mrs. Grundy because they keep it. As a politician, he will cry out that war is a waste of life. And then as a philosopher, that all life is a waste of time. A Russian pessimist will denounce a policeman for killing a peasant and then prove by the highest philosophical principles that the peasant ought to have killed himself. A man denounces marriage as a lie and then denounces aristocratic profligates for treating it as a lie. 
he calls a flag a bauble and then blames the oppressors of Poland or Ireland because they take away that bauble. The man of this school goes first to a political meeting where he complains that savages are treated as if, as if they were beasts. Then he takes his hat and umbrella and goes on to a scientific meeting where he proves that they practically are beasts. In short, the modern revolutionist, being an infinite skeptic, is always engaged in undermining his own minds. In his books on politics, he attacks men for trampling on morality. In his book on ethics, he attacks morality for trampling on men. Therefore, the modern man in revolt has become practically useless for all purposes of revolt. By rebelling against everything, he has lost his right to rebel against anything. Wow. So the old rebel at least had something that they were standing for, right? Whereas the new revolutionist, it's not even that they're fighting. It's not even that they're fighting for something because the thing that they're fighting for in another context, they'll criticize that thing itself, which is what Chesterton kind of tries to demonstrate here, where he says in one book, he'll attack, um, pol uh, he, he attacks men for trampling on morality. But then another book, he attacks morality for trampling on men, right? He's not he's not aligned with anything, and because he's got nothing, he's sta man. It's such a cliche, but because he's not standing for anything, he essentially falls for everything. Because he hasn't, he, he can't rep he can't represent anything because anything that he would represent, he's also a skeptic of that thing itself. In fact, he's a skeptic of the very notion that he can reach conclusions, which is a scary thing to think about. Sometimes, sometimes you read Chesterton, right? This is written like a hundred years ago. And it feels like he's writing about the world today, right? It's, it's actually incredible. Okay, so we're actually getting to... Looks like we're almost at the end. Uh, like I said, this is going to be a long episode. So I'm going to keep going. Um, uh, we're almost at the end. But man, this has been this has been a lot of fun. I hope, you, I, hope, I hope some of you are enjoying this as much as I am. This is really interesting. It may be added that the same blank and bankruptcy can be observed in all fierce and terrible types of literature, especially in satire. Satire may be mad and anarchic, but it presupposes an admitted superiority in certain things over others. It presupposes a standard. So even satire, which is basically, in a sense, absurd, right? Um, it's not necessarily... It's not, it's, it's not necessarily trying to take itself very seriously. But even satire assumes that there is a better and a worse. So even satire assumes there's a standard. When little boys on the street laugh at the fatness of some distinguished journalist, they are unconsciously assuming a standard of Greek sculpture. They are appealing to the marble Apollo. And the curious disappearances of satire from our literature is an instance of the fierce things fading for want of any principle to be fierce about. Nietzsche had some natural talent for sarcasm. He could sneer, though he could not laugh. But there is always something bodiless and without weight in his satire, simply because it has not any mass of common morality behind it. He is himself more preposterous than anything he denounces. But indeed, Nietzsche will stand very well as the type of the whole of, his, of this failure of abstract violence. The softening of the brain, which ultimately overtook him, was not a physical accident. If Nietzsche had not ended in imbecility, Nietzscheanism would end in imbecility. Thinking in isolation and with pride ends in being an idiot. Every man who will not have softening of the heart must at last have softening of the brain. This last attempt to evade intellectualism ends in intellectualism and therefore in death. The sortie has failed. The wild worship of lawlessness and the materialist worship of law end in the same void. Nietzsche scales staggering mountains, but he turns up ultimately in Tibet. He sits down be beside Tolstoy in the land of nothing and nirvana. They are both helpless, one because he must not grasp anything, and the other because he must not let go of anything. The Tolstoyan's will is frozen by a Buddhist instinct that all special actions are evil. But the Nietzscheanite's will is quite equally frozen by his view that all special actions are good. For if all special actions are good, 
none of them are special. They stand at the crossroads, and one hates all the roads, and the other likes all the roads. The result is, well, some things are not hard to calculate. They stand at the crossroads. Here I end, thank God, the first and dullest business of this book, the rough review of recent thought. After this, I begin to sketch a view of life which may not interest my reader, but which at any rate interests me. In front of me, as I close this page, is a pile of modern books that I have been turning over for the purpose, a pile of ingenuity, a pile of futility. By the accident of my present, by the accident of my present attachment, I can see the inevitable smash of the philosophies of Schopenhauer and Tolstoy, Nietzsche and Shaw, as clearly as an inevitable railway smash could be seen from a balloon. They are all on the road to the emptiness of the asylum, for madness may be defined as using mental activity so as to reach mental helplessness, and they have nearly reached it. He who thinks he is made of glass thinks to the destruction of thought, for glass cannot think. So he who wills to reject nothing wills the destruction of will, for will is not only the choice of something, but the rejection of almost everything. I think I'm going to try and break that down a little bit. Um, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, shout out to Keenan. He recently asked me about this um, this point, and I thought about it quite a bit. Uh, it, it's it's very paradoxical, so I'm going to read th read through it, and we'll sort of take it slowly. But it says, "So he who wills to reject nothing." Okay, that's the first point. Um, I, I will to reject nothing. In other words, I will everything. Everything is permitted. I will everything. He who wills to reject nothing wills the destruction of will. So by doing this, by willing everything, I'm actually willing the end of will. Why? For will is not only a choice of something, but the rejection of almost everything. You see, when you say, I will everything... The moment you will something, you actually don't will everything. The moment you will something, if I will to, to accept a job at this company, I'm at the same time not accepting. I'm willing not to accept all of the other available jobs which I might uh, be able to take, right? So the very act of willing something is limitation. So to say I will everything actually me means you're not really willing because to will something is to to imply is to assert limitation okay so i'll read it one more time so he who wills to reject nothing wills the destruction of will for will is not only the choice of something but the rejection of almost everything and as i turn and tumble over the clever wonderful tiresome and useless modern books the title of one of them rivets my eye it's called Jean d'Arc by Anatole France. I have only glanced at it, but a glance was enough to remind me of Renan's Ve de Jesus. It has the same strange method of the reverent skeptic. It discredits supernatural stories that have some foundation simply by telling natural stories that have no foundation. Because we cannot believe in what a saint did, we ought to pretend that we know exactly what he felt but I do not mention either book in order to criticize it, but because the accidental combination of the names called up two startling images of sanity which blasted all the books before me. Joan of Arc was not stuck at the crossroads either by rejecting all the paths like Tolstoy or by accepting them all like Nietzsche. She chose a path and went down it like a thunderbolt. So she's not willing everything, right? Accepting all roads. But she's also not, uh, she's also denying will. She's also sorry, she's also not denying will. She's also saying I'm not gonna she's not saying I'm not gonna choose anything, right? Which would be the sort of Tolstoyan uh, more Buddhist approach. I'm not gonna pursue anything and Nietzsche's sort of I will everything. She's she's not doing that. She's she's making a choice, is what he's saying. Um she chose a path and went down it like a thunderbolt. Yet Joan, when I came to think of her, had in all, in all that was true either in Tolstoy or Nietzsche, all that was even tolerable in either of them. I thought of all that is noble in Tolstoy, 
the pleasure in plain things, especially in plain pity, the actualities of the earth, the reverence for the poor, the dignity of the bowed, bowed back. Joan of Arc had all that, and with this great addition, that she endured poverty as well as admiring it. Whereas Tolstoy is only a typical aristocrat trying to find out its secrets. And then I thought of all that was brave and proud and pathetic in poor Nietzsche, and his mutiny against the emptiness and timidity of our time. I thought of his cry for the ecstatic equilibrium of danger, his hunger for the rush of great horses, his cry to arms. Well, Joan of Arc had all that, and again with this difference, that she did not praise fighting, but fought. We know that she was not afraid of an army, while Nietzsche, for we know, was afraid of a cow. Tolstoy only praised the peasant. She was the peasant. Nietzsche only praised the warrior. She was the warrior. She beat them both at their own antagonistic ideals. She was more gentle than the one, more violent than the other. Sort of taking the best qualities of both, right? Yet she was a perfectly practical person who did something, while they are wild speculators who do nothing. It was impossible that the thought should not cross my mind that she and her faith had perhaps some secret of moral unity and utility that has been lost. And with that thought came a larger one, and the colossal figure of her master had also crossed the theater of my thoughts. The same modern difficulty which darkened the subject matter of Anatole France also darkened that of Ernest Renan. Renan also divided his hero's pity from his hero's pugnacity. Now notice we're going right back to the idea that we explored at the beginning of this chapter, right? Which is the separation of values. When Chesterton says, thinking about Joan of Arc, right, came a much larger thought. He started to think about her master, which is Christ which is Jesus, right? You're going to hear, he's going to go into this now. So, Renan has divided his hero's pity from his hero's pugnacity, right? He's, he's isolating the virtues, which we talked about right at the beginning. Renan even represented the righteous anger at Jerusalem as a mere nervous breakdown after the idyllic expectations of Galilee, as if there were any inconsistency between having a love for humanity and having a hatred for inhumanity. Okay, so now he's going to focus in on Joan of Arc's master, which is Christ. Altruists with thin, weak voices deny, de denounce Christ as an egoist. Egoists with even thinner and weaker voices denounce him as an altruist. He doesn't fit into either category. This is actually the topic that Chesterton explores in chapter 5, The Paradoxes of Christianity, where Christ can hold within him two paradoxical natures at the same time. So listen to this. In our present atmosphere, such cavils are comprehensible enough. The love of a hero is more terrible than the hatred of a tyrant. The hatred of a hero is more generous than the love of a philanthropist. There is a huge and heroic sanity of which the moderns can only collect the fragments. There is a giant of whom we see only the lopped arms and legs walking about. Because the moderns have torn the soul of Christ into silly strips labeled egoism and altruism. And they are equally puzzled by his insane magnificence and his insane meekness. His insane, the fact that he's God, but at the same time his insane level of humility. That he can hold within him these two contrasting uh, virtues at the same time. Uh, and, and, and this relates to what he's saying about Joan of Arc, right? Because... She's pointing out that Nietzsche approached things one way and Tolstoy approached them another way. But he mentions that Joan of Arc had both at the same time. I'll just read that part again so uh, I can just make that clear. Well, Joan of Arc had all that. And again, with this difference, she did not praise fighting, but she fought. We know that she was not afraid of an army, while Nietzsche, for all we know, was afraid of a cow. Tolstoy only praised the, pre the peasant. She was the peasant. Nietzsche only praised the warrior. She was the warrior. She beat them both at their own antagonistic ideals. She was more gentle than the one and more violent than the other. Right? So she's got these two, these two seemingly contradictory things held in tension. And he then says, what, what, what moderns try and do with, Christ's, with Christ, 
altruists denounce him as too egotistical and egotists denounce him as too altruistic because Christ has both. He has the sheer magnificence of being God in the flesh, but he also has this insane humility to wash to wash someone's feet, right? As God, the creator of everything, the level of humility involved, they can't square it with the fact that he is so magnificent. So they take what they want from Christ and they leave what doesn't what doesn't apply to their understanding. So Chesterton ends with this. He says, There is a giant of whom we see only the lopped arms and legs walking about. They have torn the soul of Christ into silly strips labeled egoism and altruism, and they are equally puzzled by his insane magnificence and his insane meekness. They have parted his garments among them, and for his vesture they have cast lots, though the coat was without seam, and from the top... uh, Sorry. His vesture they have cast lots, though the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. Okay, so... Notice he mentions silly strips of altruism and egoism. Now he's saying the altruists and the egoists are sort of taking bets. I want to get this part of Christ. I want to get this strip. I want to get the altruistic strip. I want to get the egoistic strip of his clothing, of his, of his, uh, of his garments, right? But then Chesterton says they've cast lots. They've taken bet. They've taken bets, but Christ's, Christ's coat, Christ's vesture, his his garments, they are woven. Okay, sorry. (laughs) His vesture, they have cast lots. Though the coat was without seam, it wasn't strips. It is, it's woven from the top throughout. So the insane humility and the insane, the the, the, the fact that he's extremely humble, but the fact that he's also God, both both those things come together in Christ. They aren't strips of him. He doesn't have an egoistic, uh, egoistic side and an altruistic side. There is simply the unified, uh, um, the unified, cooperating, working paradox that Christ can be the the most incredible God and the most humble at the same time. And they can't understand that. They're looking for strips, but the coat is one seamless garment. Okay, so. That is actually the end of chapter 3. We did it. The next chapter is chapter 4, uh, The Ethics of Alfland, which is probably going to be like four or five parts because it's such such a deep, such a deep chapter. Um, it's probably the chapter in this book, Orthodoxy, which has had the biggest effect on me. It's really, really one of those chapters that can change the way you see the world, which is the great thing about Chesterton. Is you're never the same person after you've read a little bit. And uh, I just want to say a big thank you to all of you for being here. I hope that you enjoyed this. Um, I know I've got a little bit rambly at points, but I find that when I ramble a bit, usually that's when I stumble upon something useful or something interesting to say. Uh, I did a lot of prep for this one, and I tried to make it a little bit more um, easy to follow along with the slides that I put up, like these slides. So if you enjoyed this kind of approach to the topic, let me know. Um, You can drop me a comment or leave me a like. I actually do read my feedback, so I'd really appreciate it if you could just give me some feedback. Um, It helps me figure out um, what I can improve upon, and I really don't take feedback in a negative way. I I just appreciate it, even if it's like outright hate mail. That's okay. (laughs) At least I've motivated you enough to write something. Okay, well, anyway, not to keep you too long, we are finished with this reading of... Orthodoxy chapter 3. We're next next time we'll be looking at chapter 4. I hope you enjoyed it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for your time. Your time is the most valuable thing you have, so I hope I didn't waste any of it. I'm wishing you a wonderful week ahead, wherever you are on this planet. And uh, I'll see you in the next video. This has been Existential Delight. If you want to support the channel, if you're new here, please consider subscribing. I've done readings like this for chapter 1, 2, 3... And uh, four is coming up. I've also got Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis on my channel. Uh, I'm, st- I'm going to continue that series at some point. And then I have a lot of other videos. Um, I've got something coming out shortly which involves Slavoj Zizek, where he actually talks about Chesterton. Not everything on my channel is Chesterton related, um, but I'm a huge fan of his, and um, I just like to talk about what interests me, and right now it's Chesterton. So if you're into that, 
please feel free to stick around please subscribe please leave a like appreciate your feedback and please share this with a friend if you think they'd enjoy it but on that note uh, my name is dylan this has been existential delight thank you so much for watching and i'll see you in the next video goodbye for now